afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, before I start, I'll just introduce you to my team. There's Sam Collard, who has probably got 10, 15 years of good experience. Um, next to him is Mitesh Gulata, who's an architect working with us. And Atul, at the end, who's also extensive experience in the Now, the reason I've got the whole team here with me is that if you don't ask us questions, we're going to ask you questions. And ours will be, will be more difficult than yours, I can assure you. Um, I'd like this to be a, a, a participation uh, session where if you have questions as we're speaking, please ask them, put your hand up. If there's something at the time, particularly when we take you through some of the modelling that we, we're going to show you, it's easier to ask a question at the time while the model's open and we might be able to show you what you need to show. So don't be afraid to put your hand up and ask the question. If you don't understand my answer in my mixture of Australian and English, we'll try Sam, who's got a very strong Scottish accent. And if you can't understand him, we have Mitesh and Atul, who I'm sure you will understand. The, the presentation is broken down into, into two parts. I'm going to present to you the reasons for working in BIM and the benefits you can gain by it and why we have to do it. Then the team are going to show you some examples on projects we're working on from um, clash detection, asset management, facilities management for infrastructure as well as buildings, how BIM as a tool can help you control the way in which you document and register a project from initial concept through to handover. I'll talk a bit about the pitch on the front as we go through um, the, the presentation and why it's there, uh, but there is a reason for putting the two illustrations we've shown. Okay, firstly, um, what, why, why change is necessary? Um, I came from an era where we drew drawings on the drawing board manually. I went through the um, changeover to AutoCAD drawings, which was extremely painful. Now we're going through another exchange from 2D to 3D, which is also painful. So why go through this whole aspect of change unless there's a benefit for it? Some quick comparisons of integrated project delivery with standard uh, design. Some uh, examples of return on investment because the first thing any client will say to you if you want to implement something new is what is in it for him? Why should he change? If there's no benefit for him, why not keep things as they are? Uh, we'll show you some BIM benefits, some case studies, examples of BIM for FM and a successful project implementation. Lastly, anything you want to discuss. The thing you should be considering when you're talking about BIM is what do you think you can do in a 3D environment with um, data and drawings to make the whole construction process easier, be it in costing, design, operational. And there are a whole number of aspects that haven't been addressed by the industry yet. So if you have some thoughts as to a process that's tedious, long, difficult to follow, and you have a, a suggestion of how to improve it, there's lots of opportunity for people of your era, your intelligence, to come forward with those ideas, develop something that will lead the industry. Okay, the first thing. Reason for change is, in the construction industry, there's, there's been no improvement in efficiency over 60 years. Now, I can only speak for 47 of those years, and I can guarantee there's been no improvement. We're still wasting the same amount of time, materials, um, effort that we were wasting when I first started in the industry. And that skip you see there, full of wasted materials, we were on a, a project in Dubai um, four weeks ago. It is an iconic project designed by one of the world's leading architects. They were busy stripping materials out of the basement to try and make things fit, make them work, because they just didn't work. The project should have been handed over last year, still not handed over. Had they been working in a BIM environment, that would not have been necessary. Unfortunately, in construction, there is no productivity index that's published to verify 
on wastage. If you go to manufacturing and production, there is. And I met a guy who was working at Toyota last year, and he moved to the air conditioning industry, manufacturing chillers. And he told me a very interesting statistic at Toyota. He said when he joined them four years ago, the average shelf life for a car component before it was installed in the car was about three to four months. When he left them, it was six minutes. Now, if industry can do that, why can't we do it in the construction industry? We may not meet those sort of um, efficiencies, but I'm sure we can improve uh, substantially from where we are now. On our side, we are, um, we are an NEP consultancy. We design all services for buildings. We detail architecture, and we work in a BIM environment. So on the MEP side, majority of buildings are over-designed, grossly over-designed in some cases. And SIBSI, um, the Chartered Institute of Building Service Engineers in the UK, did a survey, and they found that typical excess margins on cooling load and heat load calculations, for example, were 30%, with margins up to 84%. They also found that you could reduce the capacity of, of a plant by 20% if it was sized correctly and still have no major impact on the building performance. So there's some massive benefits to be made by getting the equipment capacities correct. And I'll show you an example in a minute of how BIM can help do that. In India, it's a different case altogether because what we find is 90% of buildings are designed on thumb rules. They don't even do proper calculations. So the savings that can be made are substantial. What we have to do is get the historical data to prove to clients and show them using new technologies such as BIM that that is the case and the benefits that can be gained. So if we're working in a BIM environment, early engagement is, is really the key. Because what these graphs show here is that the earlier you, you make a change in the building design and the earlier you decide on the process of design, the less costly any changes are going to be. And typically, uh, the design process, um, decisions are made late, as in uh, graph number two, you see the curve, decisions are made at the end of the design. And when you go to projects, if, if you do internships or your work experience, when you come towards the end of the project, what you will see is, traditionally, the majority of, of the number of people you have on site increases. Whereas if you look at your program sheets, the number of people should be decreasing towards the end of the project because trade should be finished. In 47 years, I don't think I've worked on a project where that actually happened. So work is done in inefficient. So just the process showing the difference between traditional project delivery, which is fragmented, it's linear, and people work individually on their own aspects of the design, remote from the team, it's two-dimensional, and there's no risk sharing. Whoops. Whereas in integrated project delivery, the team works together from the start. And in the ideal situation, the whole team would be working on a single BIM model. So that anybody working on the model, at any time, sees what everybody else is doing. That happens in some cases nowadays, but still in the majority of projects, we find that individual teams are working on their own models, which are then pulled together, which again uh, leads to inefficiencies. So what are the typical life cycle costs of building? Um, you probably go through this in, in your studies here, but these are uh, figures published by one of the leading developers in Dubai, where design costs are typically about 3% of the life cycle costs. The build costs are about 17%. The operational costs are about 80%. So you can see that the majority of cost of the life cycle of the building is during the operational period. So by spending a little bit more time and effort and cost in the design stage, 
which might equate to 1, 2, or 3% extra, you could probably save 20, 30, 40, and 50% of the life cycle costs. But it's, it's understanding how to present that in a way to a developer and what his needs are for each particular project. For example, some developers develop a building to sell. They're not interested in the operational costs. They're interested in the capital costs. So you have to demonstrate how you can reduce the capital costs. Long-term owners are interested in both. So you have to demonstrate both. These are some examples of return on investment from BIM, which uh, from actual case studies, where um, research has been done by a, an Australian QS, talking to owners, developers, contractors, to ask them what the results are from their experiences with BIM. Most interesting one is up to 40% of unbudgeted changes eliminated. And that's because the, a number of changes occur during design and construction because in a 2D environment you cannot fully visualise what you're going to produce. In a 3D environment it's much easier to see the building before you can build it. And we, you know, we have a saying that soon we'll be building buildings twice, one virtually in a 3D model and then when we've got the model correct, we'll then actually build it on site correctly. You can also get the cost estimation accuracy a lot more accurate using the model. You can take off quantities very accurately. They will reflect what's in the model. And if the model's coordinated, they should be 99% correct or thereabouts. And project cost reductions ranging from 15 to 26%. The UK did a, an exercise that they implemented a, a mandatory bid policy for government projects last year. But they monitored the number of projects that were completed over the past few years. Um, some projects being identical to ones that were completed in 2D. By completing the same project in 3D, they found savings of about 20%. So in reality, savings have been proven. For the contracts and subcontractors, the savings are, firstly, if it's a coordinated uh, design and set of documents, the number of RFIs should be reduced because they shouldn't be asking why there are clashes, which drawings are correct. They can prefabricate a lot easier. So prefabrication reduces the manpower required on site, increases the efficiency of doing work, and reduces the cost. They can get improvement in supply chain engagement because they're, they're dealing with accurate equipment information. They're dealing with accurate quantities. So the suppliers uh, are realizing that they don't have to keep going back and re-estimating re things for changes. And then for architects and consultants, um, one thing we haven't got down here is more profitability because we can increase our fees. But in reality, we should be able to reduce our costs by being more efficient and reduce our wastage. So, if everything's so good, why is BIM not implemented throughout the world and on every project? Well, this was a survey carried out by the RICS University here. And this is just a summary of some of the comments that came back from industry. There is a mindset barrier that, that people actually don't understand what BIM means. And it's uh, interesting, I've spoken at a number of conferences and the sort of questions I get back is, where can I buy BIM? Where is it available from? Which, which, which is the software that will give me everything I need? And what we have to do is educate people that it's not, it is not a package, it is whatever you want it to be. There are a number of software programs out there that help you do certain things. But right from the start, you have to decide what is inefficient, how you can improve it, what tools are available, and how you can use BIM yourself by adding to it, subtracting from it, manipulating it to give you a more usable uh, design tool. The other thing is the high cost of hardware and software. You know, when we started off designing buildings with a drawing board and pens, the cost of the draftsman was, was very cheap. Then we moved to 2D, where you needed a, a computer uh, with quite a small memory. The cost increased. Now, 
We need a, um, a large computer, a large hard drive. We need a lot of software, which is expensive. So the cost to convert to drawing from 2D to 3D is quite expensive. So who's going to pay for it? When we first start working in BIM, and um, the, the path is, and Sam will probably mention this later, is it's not just about the tools, it's the people. If the people don't have the mindset and understand how the process works, it will be a much more costly, expensive, and have the same sort of errors that 2D has. It's important that everybody works together, going down the same path, otherwise the cost of all the hardware, software, training is all wasted. And it will take time. Um, when I was back in the UK earlier this year, it was amazing the number of uh, consultants who told me that they would not try to do what we're doing here in India. And the main reason is the cost, the hardware and software is very expensive, the cost of labour is very expensive, the availability of people with the skills to do it is just not that. So in India we have a fantastic opportunity, I believe, to lead the world in bed. And it's people like yourselves who are going to grasp that opportunity, look at the areas where you can use it and convince the clients you're working for and the people you're working for that it does actually improve what you do. Um, there is more upfront effort and team discipline required because you have to set your strategy right from the start as to how the buildings, properties, infrastructure is going to be designed, built and developed. And also if you make a change down the track, it's far easier to do it at the moment in 2D than 3D. So changes as they happen uh, have to be monitored and controlled to make sure it's efficient. So now I'll just take you through a few examples of how BIM can help you in concept, scheme, detailed design, construction, commissioning and facility management. And after that, the team are going to actually show you some examples of projects in BIM. So the first one is, I mentioned earlier that most people over-design buildings. And people have a perception that if you have a lead platinum building, as an example, it will be a lot more efficient than the lead gold, the lead silver, or a non-lead credit building. That, in fact, is, is not the truth. As this example will show you, the, this is a building with the same floor area with three different massing models. So you could build this building to any one of these configurations, and any one of these configurations could get you the maximum green accreditation. So have a think about, have a look at them and see if you can uh, determine which one would have the least energy use. Anybody want to have a guess? Third one? This one here? Yep, okay, so let's see. So the first one has got an average of 117 kilowatt hours per square meter per year. 24 hours, sorry, 24 dollars per square meter per year running cost. The daylight 68 percent. Second one, 67 kilowatt hours per square meter. 11 dollars per square meter per year. 90 percent daylight. The third one, 74. So actually, the middle one is the most efficient building. But you could submit any of those buildings for a green accreditation, as long as you meet the glazing areas, the U values, shading coefficients, and the other parameters of the green accreditation, they would all give you the maximum accreditation. So having that green accreditation rating doesn't necessarily mean you've got the most efficient design. This is just an example of a building we looked at in, in Gurgaon, where the design is as shown on the left, or on your right, is it? Um, and we, we put into an energy model, so this is something we do right at the start of design. And as you come into work in the industry, if you're involved either with a developer, a client, a consultant, 
is something that you should be doing right from the start to establish what is the most efficient form of that building and to get the um, accurate figures for the cooling load which then determines your power load. So that particular building, um, we changed very little on it. We changed the air conditioning system type, we changed the glazing slightly, and we reduced the energy significantly. When we uh, plotted the uh, savings in energy costs over a 25 year life cycle of the building, there was a $51 million uh, saving, or oh, sorry, $43 million saving in running costs by just changing some parameters of the building, and the actual capital cost reduced by $8 million. So you don't have to spend more money to get a more efficient solution. The point is that the tools like BIM that enable you to do these comparisons very quickly and very easily. So that there's no excuse in this, this age for people saying it's difficult to do it because it's not difficult. If you have the tools, it's very simple. And you can in fact sit down with a design team, connect to the uh, software program, with your 3D model, and you can make changes on the spot, get a result within less than two minutes of what the effect is of making certain changes in the design. So that when you finish the concept, you're very confident you have the most optimized design that will cost the client the least in capital and operating costs. What happens so many times on projects is we get to tender stage, the job is tendered, as the speaker this morning said, if anybody wasn't here, then an accurate budget is done and the project comes in over budget. So what happens is you end up going back and visiting the design again. And you end up um, with a design that's not quite what you need, that costs more money, and a delayed program which increases the cost again. So spend a lot of time at the concept stage optimising the design, making sure it's efficient. The traditional um, way of designing projects, which most consultants do, is we have a, a DBR, Design Brief Report. So at concept stage, we get a report on what the recommended systems are, the client approves it, we then go into a single line uh, schematic design. Once that's developed, we go into double line uh, AutoCAD drawings, then we go into issue for tender drawings. Then we go into good for construction drawings, and the contractor either repeats the consultant's drawings and just puts a title block on them, or he does a proper shop drawing and faces all the coordination problems on site. So there's a whole process of documentation that's gone through, which a lot of it is a waste of time and can be cut out if you're working in a bit environment. This is how we change it when we work in a bit environment. So first of all, we do the signal line schematic at drawings after we've got the concept agreed. We then go into value engineering, we call it user requirement exercise, where the whole team, and if possible, and it really is beneficial to bring a contractor in, to go through every aspect of the design from architectural, structural, NEP, and make sure that you've optimised everything from a construction and design point of view. From that point, we go straight into a 3D BIM model. We miss out the various levels of, of 2D drawings. And what, what that does is, particularly if you're working in line with the architect, you can resolve all the tight pinch point areas in the main plant rooms by detailing 3D in those areas. You don't have to go into doing a 3D layout for the rest of the building where design's developing, but finish that as the architect finishes his drawings. At tender stage, you then just extract 2D drawings, LOD 200, 300 for tender. That same model can then be handed down to track to the contractor, or the consultant can use it for doing shop drawings. So you miss out a number of stages of producing drawings, which is wastage. And if you actually look at some of the large projects, how many drawings are printed, distributed, wasted, it's quite phenomenal. So in practice,
practice does it work? Um, the picture I uh, showed you on the front was this picture here. This is a project in Afghanistan, one of four that we're doing, and these pictures here are all from the Afghanistan projects. We're engaged by a developer in Dubai, developing nearly 5 million square feet of mixed-use development, and we originally worked in 2D. When it came to construction, he had a big problem because he couldn't get any of the contractors from outside to go to Afghanistan to do work. So what he decided to do was engage people himself, engage a construction manager, engage site supervisors, engage an MEP engineer. So we converted all the 2D documents into 3D. And they're working on these four projects in Afghanistan now. The quality of construction is as good, if not better, than I've seen anywhere in the world. The local developers are all approaching him asking if he will build their projects for them because the projects are going up so quick and they're so impressed with the quality and he's never built a project himself before. So the answer is, yes, it does work. Yes, it can work. But there are a number of obstacles to overcome before we get to the stage where it will be a smooth path. So with that, I'll hand over to Mitesh. Uh, Mitesh is going to take you through um, we'll show you first the, um, this project in the middle, which is the Afghan International Bank. Yeah. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Mitesh, I'm senior architect at Tegwell, and we're going to give a little sneak peek to how we implement them in our services. So, that <coughs> So this is an MEP model that we did for the project. We modeled everything. You can see uh, even the sheets are laid in. This is the fire alarm layout for the building. We've got the layouts for ducting and all. We the plan room. At the top, we'll just walk you through some sheets that we did, which are uh, GSC. I'll just add some comments as Mitesh is going through it. We we took over this project when it had been designed and tendered from another consultant, and by doing the energy model on this project, we we have the energy consumption. And the big issue in Afghanistan is, is a lack of power because of the various wars and troubles they've had over the last 20 years. The, the power infrastructure is not being upgraded. But the power they have is very reliable, in fact more reliable than India because it's hydroelectric power that comes from <laughs> Uzbekistan, but there's not enough of it. So in, in having the power required to run the bank um, meant they didn't have to apply for more power, there was enough locally available in that area, which meant it took a massive cost off the developer because he would have had to run a new cable seven kilometers from the site to give the upgrade he needed. So straight away, the energy model was proven to, to be well worth what it, was, uh, what it cost to do it. And then it reduced everything within the building and reduced the capital cost as well. So back to the BIM model and uh, the workflow, what it enables us is to have an integrated model and where we have single source of information for every discipline and even a visual representation as well as data associated with it. So there's that and I'm going to show you an architecture model that we did for uh, a developer in Dubai. It was a small architecture project, G plus 8, building with 132 uh, apartments, where we detailed out to uh, GC stage, just running it through the building and the details that we modeled actually rather than doing it 2D. So there's even pictures and uh, yeah, FFNE, also equipments go in with the data that is 
so, uh, most of the time supplied by the vendors and everything. So you get everything in the model. Another example, uh, I'll show you an MEP project, which we did for a contractor. So this, this is a shopping mall in Abu Dhabi, for which we produce mechanical uh, shop drawings. <coughs> These are actual shop drawings which we supply to the contractor for further issuing for prefabrication of ductworks. So you see the detail that goes in, which is all tagged and properly can be scheduled out from the village itself. Just show you around the model, the details that we have. Uh, I think one of the, sorry, just to help you out here, Ritesh, the thing about this model is the collaboration aspect. So we were actually sitting in Delhi and we were collaborating with a, a team who were actually sitting in uh, uh, Abu Dhabi in Dubai. And, and the difference is to be able to create RFI requests for information and actually get that level of engagement. And whilst at the moment, it actually just looks like a, a neat uh, line of uh, unclashed models. It doesn't start out that way. We receive the consultant's information in a 2D environment, which eventually became a 3D model. That was our date. So we had, we had to look at different sources. Uh, and some of the information we weren't given. We weren't given the size of the attenuators. So we had to make our own decisions. Now in the past when I've worked in India, we, you know, the, the, the parties have worked with have made decisions and made assumptions. There's that willingness to complete the work you do. Sometimes you've got to stop and ask the question, am I doing the right thing? And get the approval of the work you're doing and gradually as you progress the design, you start to gain the knowledge. So we had workshops uh, twice a week. Uh, the program time lasted 16 weeks. This is probably one of the first jobs we actually delivered ahead of schedule. I think the client went into a toxic shock when we actually were chasing them up and saying, where's the comment? So we produced typically a drawn in four weeks, uh, which we put in for approval. Designer, and I think it took the designer at least six weeks to even approve it. So what we're saying is the paradigm shift is get the designers to come forward because uh, it had two impacts. One, we weren't doing the design quick enough and getting the drawings out. The second impact was it stopped us getting paid for four weeks. Uh, and now, even at this stage, our last drawings we issued were in June. We're still waiting for approval from the designer. So the thing about the big technology is you can make really informed decisions. You can make them at an early stage. You make them in the 3D environment. We've not done anything fantastic. We live in a world which is X, Y, and Z. We don't walk around the world and look at the floor in case we might bump into something. I think in India that's maybe a good thing because you're looking for, you know, potholes where you're going to fall out down a drain. Barry's got a story about a colleague who fell down a drain and broke his arm. But what we're actually saying is we live in a 3D world, so why don't we use the technology in a 3D world? And the other thing about the technology is, not everybody who comes to a project is a construction expert. People come in as transient experts. So what we're doing in that instance is we're actually showing them the project. We understand that they don't understand how to make decisions in a 2D world. So that actually helps us do that from that perspective. So what is the cost of developing this approximately most perfect? Uh, the cost of developing technology can be quite high. Because you've got this S curve and you go to the point where you go down and you're just not getting anywhere. But you've got to go through it. The only, I think the, the difficult part of the cost is, uh, is the uh, cost of infrastructure and the technology in India. The cost of the software, it's skewed a bit so it can be a lot. But if I can, if I can not really talk about the cost uh, of the software, let's talk about the benefits. I used to work for an architectural firm in the UK. They started doing BIM. Uh, about eight years ago. They had a turnover of six million. They now have a turnover of 10 million UK pounds. They had 60, 70 architects. 
They've now got 60 or 70 architects. So you do the maths. So the partners have really got nice big houses, the staff get nice bonus bonuses, it's a far better environment. Uh, and they, they, they're a very, very hands on practice and the clients like speaking to them. I think what they, I've got a terminology called hex bin. And I know it's a new terminology because I made it up yesterday. The hex is the human experience part of the bin. But in reality, in about three or four years' time, it will be less. It will not cost us more because the 40% of waste which we have to encounter. I, I was on a job two weeks ago in Dubai and uh, they were actually stripping out ductwork and taking it out because of the clashes. And what we're saying is that doesn't happen anymore. And, and the cost to take the ductwork out uh, can be, you know, something like 3 or 4% on the job. So we're actually talking about major disruption to the programme. If you actually, the, so the benefits are, uh, return on investment are really, you de-risk the project by using the BIM environment. I first started doing BIM because I worked on a large number of PFI hospitals and the, the company I worked with just decided they couldn't do it any other way. So I think, I think ultimately it will not be a cost increase and I think that uh, the reason I came to India is simple. You've got guys in the UK and Australia who sit in their ivory towers and they talk about BIM. What BIM lacks is an engine room, an engine room that is capable, which is articulate, and can actually turn out work quick. And that's the only reason that, apart from the living in India and a lot of places, is actually why I came here. India can do absolutely fantastic in BIM. So, and the level of design in, sir, yeah, in India, the problem is we don't design a whole structure first. No, it's. Uh, yeah, no, yeah. Uh, well, in India, the, the, the barrier is that you work in 2D and then we build a 3D model, which is completely wrong. So, well, under the example Barry gave, we actually have to build our own architectural model and a structural model uh, because we'll get a 2D model and then we'll do the MEP in 3D. All our projects are done in 3D. So what we need to try and do is to get the, the uh, architects and the structural engineers working in 3D and the only way they're going to do that is by the likes of you guys who come out we're going to come out with the skills which allows them to do that. Thank you. Alright. So, talking about technology in 3D, I'm going to show you a thousand year old asset. It's a church which has been modeled to a point cloud. So this is a church. And these are the information, the point cloud that we had initially. This is a thousand year old asset, Stone Cathedral. Uh, I don't remember it being built, neither do you, Barry. Uh, but a thousand year old asset which dominated the skyline. Uh, and it's under a renovation project. And in order to do that, we do a point cloud. Now, to turn that point cloud into a render model, which we'll show you later, uh, is a difficult, typical aspect. But what you can actually do is conditional surveys based on the point cloud. So it adds a lot of value. So even the fact that you're going to just look at the model and look at the potential deterioration. And if we actually, you know, we'll actually, that window could be an asset, and if we actually uh, put a, a barcode or a tag on that asset, you can actually show how that would deteriorate over time. So does anybody remember Harry Potter? Because that's, uh, that's Harry Potter's classroom. I've never actually read the book. I must be about the only person in the universe not to have read it. Uh, but this is, so what we did is we turned the point cloud into a Revit model uh, and we created a very, very simple model which we could do a conditional survey of it. Today we have different design options that was given for uh, the client as to how can we use a space for the renovation of that conditioning example. What uh, the elements are the condition of so I'm going to show the Revit model where we develop it from the point cloud. <coughs> so what you see as a highlight is the point cloud. The current issue with point cloud software 
is the cost of converting to a river model. I think to, to the extent it may become prohibitive. So if you go on LinkedIn, uh, there are people who are doing fantastic scans uh, and, and then the time then to take that and turn into a river model, is, it, I believe is prohibitive. I mean, I think that, that model took about six weeks to convert. It's not a very big model, but if you multiply that into the man hours, uh, it could be a barrier, so um, what we're looking at at the moment is working directly with the point cloud model. So next up, we, I'll show you uh, an asset model that we've developed where uh, we tag, asset tag, the FFNE, and this is a sample hotel where we have different equipments. So you've got the information right there in the direct model, the mechanical requirements, physical attributes and example. You can also link all the manuals. I'll just jump in here a little bit because we do a lot of hotel work and in a, in a hotel the, the assets have to be managed correctly because if anything fails and you have guests turning up who are paying for a room, um, often if things aren't right, they don't come back. So hotels try very hard to keep their guests. So that particular model that um, Mitesh showed is a, an hotel in Goa. And when you do um, a big model, if, if right from the start you know that the owner is interested in managing facilities, you can, um, attack, you can asset tag every asset that needs information, needs maintenance, that the client wants to track. Right from the start, so from when it was purchased, how much it was purchased for, what the maintenance requirements are, when it was maintained during construction, can all be linked direct to the BIM model. You don't store the information in the model, it's stored in an electronic document system remote from the model, but by simply clicking on the asset in the model, it takes you direct to the information. And even on some uh, specific items, you can link um, a maintenance video, so that if the maintenance engineer goes to a particular type of control he's never seen before, if it's tagged with his mobile phone, his iPad, he can scan the asset, which will take him direct to the uh, maintenance requirements, and attached to that could be a video that shows him how to reset the controller. Now, the, the facility to do that is available now. People aren't using it at the moment because nobody's fully aware of what is available to them. And it, it's people who are coming into the industry, meeting with clients very early on, explaining to them that the technology available now to manage your project right from the start to completion, to handover, is available. But the earlier you make decisions to use tools such as this, the more cost uh, economical it will be. So the linking that we just talked about is where all the assets, are, uh, they go into a PUD, which is called a product data template, whatever, in, uh, in the building that will have all the assets. So you can have one point information, uh, one point source of information for that particular asset. So in this example, we had bed. So where it was purchased from, when it was purchased from, so all the information can be linked directly into the model and assets. For a wall I think one of the points Barry made was that activity we've shown probably has taken us about 40 seconds. Seems like a long time in the, the current IT world. You're probably talking about 40 minutes to do that in the real world. Your first obstacle is actually getting in the, into the door where the manuals are. When you go to the manuals, they're not complete. So the, the secret about the managing the asset is actually having the information available for the lifetime of the building. We're getting a lot of clients who are actually asking for us to do this. This is now in a lot of specifications which we do. So all we're doing actually is responding to the need of the industry and what people are asking for. And if you think about it, like, uh, but I think 20% of the cost of the building is to actually build it. You've got 80% to run it. 
Uh, and, and, and you know, in the UK and, and India, I think we're talking about 30 year asset. But if you start to look at rail and infrastructure, we're talking an asset which is 60 years. The asset doesn't change, they're not going to move the tracks in a different direction. So it's really important to sort of gather this information. So let me show you some example of how we collaborate between disciplines. Uh, we're using tool called NARIS, must be familiar. So we've got various disciplines sending in their models. So, and what we do is combine them in, into NARIS and do a class check which I'll show you the start of this. And send them back by uh, remarking and setting up views. What is the class about? Where is the class about? So everyone knows and they're on single interface <laughs> as to what we are talking about. Because most of the time what happens in 2D is you send out a red club and then you have to get back why are you marking that red club. So here one can understand and really quicken that coordination process because you are in a 3D world. So these are the few clashes that we share with other consultants. How and in the real world, in a non urban environment, I guarantee that happens on site. So you can imagine the frustration of the engineers, you can actually imagine the frustration of the trades who are working. Uh, normally the predominant trade with the least information goes first, and that's the electricians. So they get in, they run the train, they put the cables in, it's probably one of the smallest services, but they never move it because you can't move the train once the cables are in. So you have a 2000 by 750 tough work which it has to move because of the 300 tree in the position which is absolutely ludicrous. So just try to do a sample class check and how interactive can that be and easy to do rather than sorting out where the lines are going. So this is uh, a million square feet project, one of the basements that we are doing right now, and scale is massive. So you can understand even if one service goes away, the impact can be massive. So these are the sample, these are the class checks that we run. Uh, fire versus fire, you can have fire pipes class, uh, clashing each other internally and also in interdisciplinary clashes are there always. So what we do is just add a test, say fire versus fire, then we run it, it'll, it'll, it'll take a little bit more time than I do it here, so I'm just going to show you what are the results. So you get a report which looks something like this. So it says what is clashing, where it is clashing, and how is it clashing. Another nice thing about this is once you update the model, once you send out the report that there is a clash, you again export an RS file and just update the clashes. So it's going to tell you how many of those flashes have been resolved in your group. So you don't need to trace and run around to do what have you done. You know how it's been resolved. Cuts back a lot of coordination time. So I think so in this process you have a big model manager who will do the coordination clashes, but the responsibility for each discipline would like the architect structure and the MEP engineer. And then we've then got to start looking at these are outputs, but you've got to actually look at inter interdependencies. So that's design information which you require to complete a task. So rather than just do a clash detection, which is the whole building and come up with 50,000 clashes, and I can assure you we, we can do that, you look at focus clashes, you look at where you're doing the work. So you look at the risers, you look at the landlord areas, you can look at the basement area, so your clashes and where you engage the pen work is in your work in progress area. And that's a, a, that's a sort of mindset shift 
where you're prepared to share work where you've got no mistakes. So you're actually bearing your soul in front of guys and say, we haven't quite got this right. But you can be rest assured the other team are like that. But gradually, you get a better understanding and you stop working in silos. You start to work as a team. And the other thing about information is it has to be in at the right time. You have to have your plumbing, you have your AC, you need to have your sprinkler pipes in at the same time. The, the issue is, the plumbing starts at the top of the building walks down, we all work the other way. So the other part of it is we need to have complete models. So as managers of the process, you need to actually schedule when you're going to get the model, schedule the outputs, but most importantly, define what you want. So as a group of individuals, when you leave this place and you have qualified and have a couple of years of experience, You'll be telling people how you want it done and what you want. So the control of the technology goes out to the room. And it'll only be people like us who will work. We will work in uh, doing MEP engineering and providing a model. But as model managers, we will work in that technology. And so what the model then becomes is a validation tool. You validate it, you sign off the model and be complete to go to the next stage. Nanosoaps. So, we talked about assisting the clash detection process. This example is something like what if you're working in 2D and then we issue GFC drawings and what happens on site. So, th these are the GFC drawings that we have to issue and these are the kind of clashes that you get. This is after coordination. So that's what the cost escalation is at time on site. That's, so going back to the slide where Mr. Barry mentioned, is it, very, it is very important to start implementing when, when you are in the design stage rather than coming back at the construction stage and saying, let's do a class check again. And, Let's do it all over again. So, can it suggest us alternative solutions? Let's say the pots are class. So, can it suggest us uh, solutions on what change them with? Like, we have auto writing numbers, right? We right click and it gives us five suggestions on what is the word, like that. Is it possible? I'm just curious. Yes, sir? Yeah. yeah. Is it possible to? The, the software is just a tool that, that um, makes sure you can re reposition things, draw them, indicate class, but you, you then need an engineer to come in and resolve how, how the class should be resolved. And, but it's a good point because there are, just to clarify, there are a lot of companies in India who are BIM modeling companies. And they will take a 2D design, convert to 3D, and give it back to you with a lot of clashes because they don't have the engineering skills to resolve whether the pipes should be moved, should the cable be removed, can the duct work aspect ratio be changed. We're an engineering company, so we come in from an engineering aspect, not from a modeling aspect. So I've seen some fantastic models of buildings, but practically they just don't work. There are clashes all over. So it needs an engineering skill to look at the clash and say, right, which is the service that has to be removed and how to is it possible that one day you can suggest us move this, move the pipe upwards? It probably is, this will be a robot doing the work, not a, a human being. Yeah. Sure. Okay, thanks. thanks. So, I have a question to ask. Hello, sir. This. So, suppose due to some humanitarian error, if some uh, clashes remains unnoticed uh, by the architect, or from the consultant side or from the client side. So how you deal with in the latest stages uh, when it comes on the side? Actually it comes, it's seen on the side. Uh, you pay for it, if you miss a class, it's been built. So you, you, the, cost, the cost of a class is probably, in UK prices, is probably about 1500 to 3000 per per class. Uh, I once, uh, was going to a job and 
they were quibbling about a fee, so I suggested that uh, I just got a return on the glasses I found on site, and I said I'd be flying out in a jet uh, because of the money I would make from the classes. So I think one of the things you've got to understand is there's no substitute for people and doing the things right. What's happened over the last 20 years is there's been a lot of economic pressures on teams. That economic pressures mean that they go for scope designs, performance specifications, they'll give you single line drawings, uh, and that means that they'll work in isolation. Even the, if you were an architect, and you're an MEP, and you're a fire engineer, and you're a plumber, and you're the worst culprit, what happens is you don't even speak to each other. You work in your silo on your computer. So what the first thing we've got to do is we get you to talk and come up. We, we've got a thing in technology we call it pad. You know what pad is? Pencil in the design. You can't actually draw something which is plastic. I started in pad. So you actually do a sketch, so that you still do the sketches and then you take that into a computer and you sort out all the the primary zones and then everybody goes and wait uh, goes away and works those primary zones. And once you've done that, you've got a very good chance of providing a model and taking the waste out of the process. The cost of waste is probably 25%. We probably spend 25% of our time redoing work because it's not done in the, in the right process. So out of 100 million, uh, what is the expenditure allotted uh, for the BIM modeling? Like what is the percentage allotted for the BIM modeling? I'll, I'll take that one because I was with a contractor in Dubai last week and he told me that his engineering and drafting modeling costs vary between 4 and 9 percent. And 4 percent is on a project where he's extremely efficient, 9 percent is more typical because of the amount of re-engineering, redesigning has to do. So it, it's quite a lot of money is wasted in engineering and re-engineering and somebody's paying for that you know it's okay saying the contract has lost that on the project but he has to regain that money because if he doesn't make a profit he's out of business and making profit is not a bad word you know every everybody in the business needs to be profitable and to be profitable you need to be efficient and working in a big environment from the start with the whole team on the same wavelength is a lot more cost effective. The sound side, it, it's the mindset of the people as much as the tools. You can have the best tools, if you don't use them in the right way, you don't get the efficiencies. Well, that's answered. Yeah. I must apologize, one of the, the downsides of BIM is it gives you grey hair, it makes you blind and actually you become hard of hearing. Uh, so uh, as you get older, you become hard, a little bit hard of hearing. Are there any more questions while we're yeah. yes, sir. Yeah. Hello, sir. <coughs> Actually, uh, if there is a mega project development going on, <coughs> and uh, I came to know about the Revit now, okay, and if I need to uh, do an energy modeling of that project, and I have the short run, uh, GFC is ready, and the model and the structure is also ready, should I uh, convert that uh, GFC is going to IFC dot IFC format and then uh, model it to energy modeling system or I need to scan that what do you recommend convert a uh, GFC drawings to Revit model or scan that whole project and then send it to energy modeling system with scanning would be a better option for that whole project or converting the files drawings to Revit model and then inputting it to modeling system. If, if you get to GFC or IFC stage, it's too late for energy modeling because you've wasted a whole um, design period. So your energy modeling should come in the concept stage. If you try and do energy modeling down the track, you're looking at redesign. So that will delay the project considerably. If you're working in a BIM environment, you should be working in 3D straight after skin design. <laughs> So everything should be done in a 3D environment. You extract your 2D droids from the 3D model at different stages with a different level of detail. 
because that same model can be used for tandem and for shop drawings. It needs a lot more developing to get to shop drawing stage. As, as a consulting practice, we do shop drawings for contractors. But what often happens is we come in too late, and the examples we're showing here of all these clashes are what you get when you convert a 2D GFC drawing into a BIM model. You'll find that there are hundreds of clashes. Whereas if you start off in a BIM environment working in 3D, you avoid these. Okay, Paul, that answers your question. Hello, sir. Uh, so you have shown us a lot of models. Could you please tell us uh, in which level of development these models are, uh, so that we could uh, get a disting distinction between LOD 300, LOD 400, like that? Yeah, the models uh, we have shown initially are LOD 300 models. Uh, currently, we we got to do LOD 100. There isn't such a thing in our book. Uh, so you, what you want to do is start with objects with information attributed. So it just, it's just the development of the design stage. So concept stage, we probably start at LD 200. And when you get to the design stage, you have an LD 300 draw. Uh, and you have generic objects in that model. The reason why you have generic objects is you have to tender that design. So if you go with a specific manufacturer's object, which is LD 500, it doesn't allow somebody to go and price it. But you can have an LOD 500 object and categorize it as LOD 300. So as a designer you would issue an LOD 300 model uh, with information. And the other thing about it is you don't want to uh, add manufacturers, objects with too much details into the model. And that's why we're looking at an electronic document management system because models have become too heavy. And if you get anything over 500 megabytes, it can be used by supercomputers, but what we want is, we want a laptop, and what we want a project, projection screen. We want that in every site office, and every office across India, which allows to do so. You're currently seeing LD300 drawings at design stage. And sir, so, uh, are there any specifications that have to be kept in mind when these models are made? Like there are some uh, recommendations in NatSpec, there are some recommendations in Uniforum. So, uh, any important specification that we should keep in mind when we are making the models? Yeah, there is, but we don't have one in India, so the specifications you need to keep in mind are the ones you're going to do in India. Because if you borrow a specification from the UK, so the UK will have uh, PASA 1192, 1193, uh, and a way of working, but that's just going to be the way the British will do it. But the, what I've learned is that you need to adapt the technology to how you work in the local market. So what we're missing from is working in this environment. We need to generate BIM standards in India. Uh, we need to not make that long process. We could probably write them in six months. And that is the other criteria across most of the world is there isn't such a thing as a bad model. Because we haven't categorized what a good model is. So we haven't benchmarked what it is. So when we categorize what a good model looks like, we can then say that. But most of the countries uh, who are not mandating BIM are working in a, a 3D unmanaged environment where you do define what people require, as they do in the Middle East. So they say they want 3D, 4D, uh, and they want 5D, which is cost, they want 6D. All of a sudden, you're going to wipe out a whole strata of people who are working here in BIM. So uh, you know, I think we're at the cost of changing in, in, in India. So I think within the next 12 months, it would be good if India established its standard. But I wouldn't be following that spec. I wouldn't be following past 1192. But do take the benefit of what they've done, because don't reinvent what, what they've done. You take and, and just get out there quickly. Yeah. Thank you. Good afternoon, sir. My name is Bhushan Sharma. I am from MBCTM. I want to ask a question regarding clash detection. While doing clash detection, there can be hundreds of clashes on each floor and can be thousands uh, in a whole project. I am talking about a huge project. So, uh, after uh, working in Navis work, after detecting clashes, we have to go back to the Revit model and uh, you generate a report and uh, there can be numerous of that clashes and it will be difficult for the architecture to read those, to identify those places. How painful is that? 
and uh, the num uh, number of uh, people working on that model, how painful it, uh, for, for them to integrate it. Uh, so, firstly, what you do is you generate a class detection report and you have a cycle of the project. Every two weeks you generate a report. Uh, so what you need to do is have the design team, the most important thing is give the design team time to build their model. So you leave them alone, give them two weeks to build the model, we'll then assemble the classes and then we'll do a report and then it's then discussed in the design team. You'll probably find out that maybe 60-70% of the issues can be resolved without the design team engaging, but the major classes will be resolved. Uh, by working with the architect, the structure, and the MEP. It was not a problem before, because we never knew what the classes were, so we just built the model. We built, we actually, we built out on site. So it's becoming a more complex process, because the model, uh, if, you, if you watch Lord of the Rings, and you've actually got the C&I, you know, and, and, and what, you can actually see everything in the model. So it actually shows you everything that is wrong. It's your decision whether you choose to fix that or leave it. But we, we actually working progressively through. Uh, I didn't think we would do this. I think we're working progressively through to get zero flash models at the design stage. But it takes longer. Uh, but I would, you, you would say, sometimes you've got to have a little bit of tolerance. So why wouldn't you issue a clash model to the contractor? Because you issue a model with minor clashes. If you've got clashes in the plan room, you can fix them. If we've got classes in a service riser, we need to fix them. If we've got classes in a congested area in a corridor and you put a plastic wall ceiling, which we personally hate, you can fix them. But if it's in an open area with a laid grid ceiling, down the contractor. The contractor has been paid for a long, long time to install drones and to do class protection and to fix them. So we're not taking that away from them. So if you actually go to a zero class scenario, you're probably going to have three, four months on your project. Thank you. To add on that, yeah. that uh, as uh, uh, sustainability and uh, sustainable construction is being uh, adopted in any of many of these projects in India, so how we can correlate that cash and carbon can be fit together in B? So could you repeat the question? I didn't Sir, uh, like in India, uh, many construction uh, companies are trying to adopt some sustainability yeah. uh, in their project. So how do we can manage our cash and carbon footprints in uh, through B? Our community is a cash and carbon footprint. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay. If the examples I showed you of doing a bit model and yeah. energy analysis by importing the 3D model into an energy program will manage your carbon footprint better than any other tool you've got. And I showed you how um, you can have a lead, the best lead graded building that is not the most efficient design for that building and area. A BIM model used in um, an energy software program will give you a better result. So straight away, you'll get a better carbon footprint by modeling it better. That better carbon footprint will cost you less money. The other issue, managing the cash, you can link your BIM model, because you, you, can, you can cost all the assets in the model, it's linked to a, um, a list of quantities, they're all costed, you can do cost comparisons much quicker. You can link that, that model then to a time program. So as the building's coming up, you, can, you know exactly how much money it should have cost you because every item in the model is costly. So you can stop the model. I think we have a construction sequence model we're going to show you soon. You can stop that model at any point in time. So if you're three months into the program, you can stop the model. You can go on site, you can check exactly where progress is. Is it on schedule? Is it behind schedule? Is it ahead of schedule? Then you can do a cost analysis that, that's not based on somebody's best guess. It's based on what's actually being built and the cost of the various components in the building. So that as a tool, it can help you manage it much better than anything else that's available on the market. Sir, uh, this means uh, in any uh, project, uh, 
being uh, has any uh, legal implications in any construction project? Do do be do that? It has the same legal implications as any other design tool. There, there are no difference in implications. The only the only thing I would say it leads everybody less open to litigation because everything is very clear to see. And it goes through the same approval process as any other design, except if you sat in this room and we're showing you a 3D walk through the building, you're much, much more likely to pick up any issues than you are sitting down looking through 2D drawings. Well, th thanks, sir. Thanks, sir. Yeah, I think that's a really good point on the legal side. I think what we on the legal side we're, prof we're probably talking about is based on common law, English common law. It's probably about 300 years old. So I don't know what 300 old, 300 years old example of English common law would apply to this technology. Uh, I think we don't want lawyers in the room. We want actually collaboration. We want new forms of contract. One of the things about the technology is you're actually we've got something we call BIM stretch. So you're looking at new things to do. And if you actually penalise the parties that are trying to improve things then the contract will stop that happening. When you talk about the developer and how they build, you can get them to engage. If I'm building a number of estates, I would, firstly I would, wouldn't build the tower. I'd ask what the apartments look like. I'd actually see how many types of apartments I would have. You must as a developer have something like 20 to 30 types of apartments, no more. So why would you build those apartments in huge detail where you've got 3D, 4D, 5D, and 6D outputs, you can actually see what the cost is of each apartment, so 80% of your build will be finished. You then go to the architect and say, give me a tower. So you've actually built most of your estate based on your BIM model. So that's where BIM can actually benefit as well. Good morning, sir. I'm Disha Dharan. So my question is, uh, we have seen BIM in large scale projects, but uh, we haven't seen BIM in small scale projects. Suppose I have a, a residential project of 500 square yards, I want to develop that. So can we use BIM in that? Would you suggest that? No. Uh, the, the, the answer to that is yeah, we can, we can use I mean, if you're building villas and estates, you, you can use BIM. Uh, probably the, the level of BIM that people would probably do at start off is about 50, 000, 50 million dollars would be a job that we do. Uh, is, uh, the text is just going to open up a model here. Uh, and this is a an art gallery in the centre of London, it's not a huge shop. And so what we did is we built a model of the plant room and the areas probably only worth about less than two million dollars UK. But it's a very complex job. So the technology applies to every job that you're working on. And this is a perfect example where somebody in the design world who didn't pay too much experience because it was a smaller job. But actually, it then came to a scenario where our job was to build the model for prefabrication. We then, we've got control panels on there, and we put them on virtual wheels because we moved them about the model at least seven times, and there was lots of clashes. And it got to the stage where our model was then used to start to build on site. The, that, that job would have been people on point cloud scan, and we didn't do that. So there's the, you've actually got to look at how you use BIM, but there is no, one of the best examples of BIM I ever saw was in the Lake District in the UK. The Lake District has a very, very strict covenant on what houses you could build, what the materials are. So there's one architect who, would, who had to work with restricted materials and he worked in domestic jobs. He had 37 jobs running simultaneously in BIM. He was making a fortune. So the secret is if you've got an, uh, if you can actually use smaller projects and use sort of prefabrication techniques that applies to all projects, small and large.
mean, uh, you have to use 2D. If you're not going to take an iPad up a step ladder or on a platform and hold your iPad in one hand and do the work, it's not safe. So you are going to have 2D drawings. Uh, you'll be able to take a collaboration tool like iPad with an iPad out with 3D and 2D. Uh, your detail has to come out of the model from 2D uh, with all the text and all, all the information. The secret is, is to get an infinite source. So 3D will be the 3D view. We'll use the technology we've got here. That technology can go out on site. So you have the 2D, you'll link the specification, you'll have the latest version. So I think it's a blend. And what you do find is that the workers out on site at the cold phase, they absolutely love this technology. They cannot get enough of it. Uh, and that then, uh, when I started working in bedrooms, the contractors who used the technology, it wasn't the designer that driving it. So the answer is, uh, you know, we talk about Oculus glasses, you know, I just think there's issues there. The first person that falls off a scaffolding and kills himself wearing Oculus glasses, the litigation will come in. So, but for very good working practices for the last 45, 50 years, we just have not had the information there. Uh, but I think there's a blend. I mean, if we visit this in five years' time, it will be totally different. I mean, the way when I came into the industry with the world of calculators, the world of faxes, we had beta max, we don't have CDs anymore, we've moved on. So in that same, what the problems we've got is keeping up with the technology which is coming out. And that's a big problem because everybody now is coming out with a different technology you have to evaluate. Uh, and and that, that's the challenge. But it, it, it's fantastic for the way we, we work and we will get those improvements. Uh, I know uh, there's a company called Solis who are actually looking at uh, a Revit drone. So you take a Revit drone on site and you can actually take your iPad and you can fly it over the Revit drone and you can see what's happening in 3D. I think that's about from a commercial point of view, it's probably about two, three years away, but it's something that will make a massive difference. Yeah. Well, so, uh, you're on the subject of 4D, 5D, so I'm just going to show you some examples of 4D first. So, we've got that. Uh, Fairly the glass side, which has the 69 towers, and we link then the schedule that we got from the contractor as to how we want to proceed with it and actually visualize how temporary structures will come up, how much resource will be required for different phases. So I'm going to just run it and uh, yeah. So this is a project in Mumbai. And the contract we were working for was 10 million. So we, we took the 2D design drawings that he was tendering on, created the 3D model, and linked it to this construction program. Uh, we, we changed the model, I think, five or six times during the, during the construction of the model to see where he wanted to position his cranes how he wanted to position his access onto the site, because each time he saw it physically, he saw the improvements he could make. So by the time we got to the final model, he'd really refined how he was going to build the project and the time it would take him to build it. So his tender was a lot more the, the other thing he wanted to do was um, have a prefabrication strategy for the um, bathrooms and, and risers. So we, we have two models. This is the construction sequence model. And you can see the cold at all the timelines. And the comment I mentioned earlier, you can stop this program now. And if you have data from the model, it will tell you exactly where you are in terms of cost for the project. You know how much cost you should have spent. You know whether you're on time or not. And it's very easy to walk on site and physically look at the the, the site and compare the models to where you are. But the second model we built for it had uh, all prefabrication sections for the rise of the bathrooms. So not, not only did he go to the um, developer and tell him and show him how he was going to build it, but he showed him where he was going to use prefabrication. 
uh, because the services weren't designed, we, we enabled them to, um, because we provided designs to the NDP, you could cost the free fabrication sector. This was the 4D bit. Moving on to quant uh, quantity extraction. I'm just going to show you the water bit. Uh, we did it. We extracted quantities for structure and scheduled out those windows from a single model. So, there we have the door schedule. We can add more information. As for the LOD of the model, what, uh, for example, doors, what kind of assembly has to go in, uh, who's the manufacturer, similarly, for structure, we extracted the quantities. This, this is a column schedule. Then we have a fragrance schedule where we've got the beams and their quantities and where all they are located. So, it's, so that's what power of single model as well. Whatever you can model can be extracted as a quantity. Just a few more examples now then we'll show you um, some slides on bin for infrastructure and asset tagging. So in terms of cost saving, um, bin for construction, because the detailing is accurate, clashes are resolved. Um, there should be no change on site. You, you should be able to build what you show in the model. Um, this is an example where we took a project that was designed in 2D. There were two towers. It was a, uh, a project here in Noida. The um, one on the left is the original design. And you can see there are a whole host of different pipe rises. Um, we, we changed the distribution and we substantially reduced the amount of pipe work by 32%, equate to 48 meters of 48 kilometers of, of pipe work we took out of the building. We put the, the tower into an energy model, reduced the cooling load, reduced the power requirement. We were able to take one floor of plant off the roof of the building. So that the savings we made were substantial. And this is where BIM as a tool can help you justify to developers that you can get benefits. By just giving him a report that says here the savings, it's very hard to, to illustrate it. But by showing in a model that shows an existing design with accurate quantities, measured against an alternative design, it's very clear. Uh, this was a project in, in Mumbai where um, the, the contractor, wanted, there were about five kilometres of risers. It was a, hotel with eight towers, each tower about 100 metres. So a lot of the guest room risers that hold the plumbing, chill water, ventilation shafts between two guest rooms were repetitive. So rather than building on site, which would have probably had a team of 100, 150 people, he was able to prefabricate them off site um, with a lot less people, a team of about 10 people would, would have worked less congestion on site, deliver them to site either before or after the slabs were cast, put them in position. He actually, um, I've got the, we have a video of this, but it was actually took him six minutes to connect one riser to the next. When they were connected, the doors were locked, so nobody could access them, so there was no damage. We can virtually commission a system in, in Reddit and EP. Uh, traditionally, the, the balancing, testing, commissioning buildings either doesn't happen or it has to happen after the buildings are occupied because construction's late, there's a lack of expertise, so what tends to happen, it doesn't get done until people start complaining. And when people start complaining, their teams come back in, start trying to commission the set up. In a building that's occupied, it's almost impossible to do. Using um, Reddit MEP, by designing the system in 3D, we can size everything correctly, we can, re we can predict the positions all the commissioning wells have to be set up. So that when you come to test, it's just a case of verifying, not starting all over from scratch. So what normally would take a month to commission a building can be done in less than a week.
Um, I'll skip this one because it's just on class detection and model verification. We've been through that previous lab. Go through these. Bin traffic integration, we've been through this, we showed you the hotel model we've done. It's a very simple task of linking the data to the model, but the earlier you start it, the better and more economic it is. And you really need to understand what the client wants at the end of the process to understand how you build the models. Yeah. Again, just showing you um, very simply, that's the TV. You click on the TV, it takes you to a data sheet that tells you what the TV is, where it's located, which room it's in, who supplied it, what the cost is, every bit of information you need on it is provided. <coughs> so, we're getting close to time now, so I'll hand back over to Sam and Mitash to show you a little, little bit about what we're doing in the infrastructure environment where, um, as Sam mentioned earlier, to understand the assets and the life cycle of those assets is very really important. So uh, I'll take you through some of the work we've done. So earlier this week we were at Transport and Infrastructure Conference, which I thought was quite interesting, because we started late, because the transport and infrastructure system didn't work and people came about an hour late. Uh, so that was a challenge. Uh, but I think what we're trying to show here is not just about buildings, and it's about a, you can have a, I don't know, 50,000 meter squared asset, or you can have a 140 kilometer asset. So the models we're going to look at at the moment, we're going to look at, which one's better? Oh, I'm going to bridge one here. So one of the things that really surprised me was in the infrastructure world, when you're going to build a, an asset which might take you from Mumbai to Delhi, how much of it's going to be elevated, how much it's going to be bridges. So I think there's an opportunity in both scenarios to build them more efficiently uh, and, and look at them from, I mean, I look at some of the columns and some of these metros and they just seem like they'll last forever and I think we can gain efficiencies there. I think one of the other common criteria was these projects are always late. So if we build them in a BIM environment, I'd probably more or less guarantee that the design would be on time, we'd have the decisions right and then we would kind of force the constructors to think about getting them on time. Uh, and the, you know, with the, the will there, you will. You, you might be three months late, you're certainly not going to be 18 months late. Uh, so, it's the same again. What we're actually talking about is build it in 3D, 2D model. Uh, could put the sheets for that one. So, when you look at it as an asset, uh, I was at a conference or, or a workshop in the UK, and somebody, one of the companies managed this asset. It was on the west coast of uh, the UK and they had the failure of a component which they had to replace. They couldn't identify that component. They didn't know which one it was, they didn't know which batch test it came. So they replaced all the components on the west coast line. That cost them a lot of money. We had a scenario in the, the Leadenhall project in the UK where they had some boats were failing again trying to find out what the asset is. So what we have here on our, in the middle there is a resident expert on assets and asset tagging at all. And so what he's done here is he's actually linked the asset to a schedule for all the structural components on that bridge. What you've got to identify is, you maybe want to identify that as an asset, but what information do you want to collect? Uh, there's probably something like 25,000 assets on that. So. You probably want to identify what asset it was as you're looking at 20 years from now, looking at the condition of it, but actually identifying whether there's a failure mode you want to identify it quite quickly. And that's where we get to the, the, the real world. Just watch your couple of sheets there.
So again, what, what you can see here is quite simply, you wouldn't not do this without prefabrication. We're quite fortunate that the leading discipline in the BIM world is our structural engineers. They've been doing it for years. Uh, the architects have been there, uh, but they seem to be lagging at this moment in time, and now we have uh, MEP engineers are there. But what we need to do in order to build a model, we need everybody to work in a BIM model environment. We don't have a mix of 2D and 3D. So we're on the last leg, last leg of the journey. The train is about to leave the station. Uh, so this is a model that was done of a metro station uh, without the rails. Without the rails, they were, they were subcontracted out to somebody else who didn't work in BIM. Uh, so what we're what talking about here is what assets do you want to collect in this environment. You certainly, we were speaking to a rail operator this week and they will have 14 metro stations in Saudi. They want to collect all the information on the assets uh, on the rail line. But again, you have an asset. One of your assets is the actual building, the escalators and the lifts. So it's a relatively simple thing. So we, this, is, this could be a real job. So we could be looking at an asset in Mumbai, we could be looking at an asset in Los Angeles. And one of the good things about the BIM technology is I was working on a job in Canada and I wanted an example that I could show the Canadians how to do BIM. I, that model was in, happened to be in Durham. When I looked at the model, I noticed there was issues regarding access and how we could get to MEP components. I then sent an email to the guys, with now I sent some, some screenshots I said, you need to look at this, guys. So 7,000 miles away, the project manager looked at that. After a week, he came back and said, thanks, sir, we've now changed the design. The power of that, the power and the ability to, to integrate. And the other thing about the technology is, why are we all trundling up and down motorways and roads to spend two hours to get to a meeting when you can do this over the internet? So I think there's a lots of efficiencies which can be gained. Uh, and I, you know, I think we'll probably just wrap it up by saying this is a technology of today. It doesn't belong to us, it belongs to you guys in the room. Uh, and if you don't engage in it, we've absolutely wasted our time here for two hours, I think. Good. Thank you. This question is for Atul. Yeah, there are many softwares. We have Costex, we have Rico software, 
you need an IFC data or a Kobe spreadsheet from the from different consultants, and then you can use that software to estimate the cost of the project. So, because what I'm seeing is the quantity that we have now extracted, it is from Revit files, and the variations that we will be calculating from normal CAD files and Revit files that will be amount. Well, certainly, uh, BIM is not going to replace the role of quantity surveyors. You you will need them because you know the variations there are things which the software is not going to calculate. You will get the quantity, exact quantity, which is there in the model. But there will be wastage, there will be uh, variations which you need to add them manually. So it's about getting the correct information and using your intelligence to do the needs. Sir, one more thing. Like once I have worked on my view model and then I'm making the fourth dimension and fifth dimension in it, then be it for whatsoever reasons, if the client makes any change in the scope of work and there is change in the design model, can we have to make the special? We have to make the implement changes in the fifth time. No, no, no. I, uh, if you have correctly linked link the information, it will be automated. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Hello, sir. My name is Gautam. Uh, I want to know how can we integrate this BIM model with virtual reality, augmented reality technology. And I believe, I firmly believe that the virtual reality and the augmented reality technology using that one, uh, we can furthermore reduce the crashes, we can furthermore reduce the reverts. So is there any way we are implementing, integrating these two technologies together? Uh, uh, how much effort we need to keep in this? How much more cost we need to induce? In this, in this way to integrate this technology. Well, uh, so, uh, certainly we have not explored that aspect of BIM as of yet, but if we have a data in a certain standard, that possibility is always there because a BIM is, uh, I, I want to make it simple, BIM is about information management, which is uh, most most important aspect of your job profile as a project manager. So, uh, well, if, it's like if you have information from all the consultants, if you have a, if you have an IFC model, you can certainly link that to a VR software, and then you can explore what we're not uh, I want to know the advantages of integrating this VR technology, augmented technology. Well, we have not explored the virtual reality. Virtual reality. Yeah, I mean, I've worked with a couple of virtual reality companies and what they do is fantastic, but it's good for a bit. Uh, it, it's just not there at this moment in time on a commercial basis. And I think if you, I mean, if you're doing a, a major project, it's a good tool to win a project. Just to give an example, a company I used to work with, they would win one in every seven jobs they tendered for. And some of these tenders would be about five million pounds UK. They won one in every two jobs after they went down the virtual reality route. So I think things like uh, traffic flow, pedestrian flow, traffic flows, that belongs in the virtual reality world, absolutely different. Trains, where actually you're mapping the tracks. But I think virtual reality is starting to get taken over by drone technology, which is, so I think virtual reality will be replaced by more affordable and simple technologies. Thank you, sir. My question is, as uh, uh, you communicated before, uh, for a better project we need to invest more time in pre-construction as uh, uh, we use BIM. So, uh, what if we you know, uh, want to construct anything very urgently, you know, we don't have any time and we don't have any time to invest in pre-construction, we just want right, uh, we just want to construct a building. So, how can we use BIM in that? That's quite a simple question. If you don't have any time to invest in pre-construction, you can invest as much time as you want building the actual job, because it'll be late, absolutely late. So you have to sit down, and there's no shortcut. This is not a technology where you can take shortcuts, so you have to invest the time. We have programs, we're always getting condensed on the program side, but we need to actually identify is to give designers time to give the outputs we require. If you want to save 
spend 20% or 10% on your construction value, you need to give the designers time to do it. It won't take much longer. It'll probably take another month or six weeks on the program, but your product will be so much better. Yeah, and quicker. Yeah, you will save time on the construction. Last question, please. Good evening, sir. Uh, so you were talking about the detailing in a beam model. So uh, in some case, you were talking, citing the example of the project project itself. Uh, some developers or some clients need some new material, which is new to the market, and that model is not being developed in any library. So that in that case, you have to develop a model for uh, applying that to uh, your own model. But my question is, how far you are taking the properties of that model into consideration, rather than being a model, uh, the other properties like U-value and other aspects, which is very important for energy modeling, I think. Look, energy modeling is a completely different aspect of uh, client adjusting for it. You need to develop that relevant model. You need to consider the uh, insulation properties, uh, behavior of different materials. But at the same time, after the energy modeling, you need to make sure that that information goes to a facility manager because if the facility manager is not going to know that how that facility is going to be managed, then there is no point of designing the, the, the sustainable planning. So again, it's about how you are going to manage the information.